Welcome to the weekly sermon podcast for the Wilmington, Ohio Church of Christ. We pray that this message will inspire you and help you grow closer to God in your faith. Be sure to stick around after the message to find out more about how you can take your next best step. Enjoy the message. What good is a brick? Where do you find value in a brick? Where could ever a brick become beautiful? What's the purpose of a brick? I got to tell you, as a soccer ball, bricks are not very good. There was an NFL wide receiver that said his dad was a bricklayer, and he said his dad would make, would throw him bricks to catch. My son played high school football the last couple of years, and he didn't catch very good, but he got better as time went on. And I said, hey, I got an idea. You want to go practice throwing the brick around so you could get better at catching? And he said, no, he didn't want to do that. Where is a brick valuable? Where is a brick beautiful? Where is a brick practical? Well, brick is designed not to stand alone, but to be built into layers, and if done correctly, it becomes a beautiful wall. Very valuable that way. Very practical. Houses made out of bricks last longer than houses made out of wood or plastic. Bricks are valuable. Charles Spurgeon would tell this story. Here's where, get ready to catch a brick. He told this story that he would come across Christians sometimes who would say something like this. I'll give my life to Christ, but I would never give my life to a church. I'll be a Jesus follower, but I'm not going to church. And he would say, well, why would you do that? And he said the response is always, I can be a good enough Christ follower, good enough Christian without belonging to a church. And he said that's about as valuable as a brick that is all by itself used for the wrong purpose. And he would say, Christian, the only way that you find value and beauty and practicality in the kingdom of God, is to live as if you were designed and for the purpose God designed you. And part of that purpose is to be connected to a gathering of people we call the church. Let's pray. God, we need help today. We need help to see where you have designed us and how you've designed us and what our purpose is and how we fit in to this church, your church. God, would you open our eyes to the Scripture and would you provide for us a transformation in our soul from your words? Would you teach us how we fit in to the church and why it is so valuable? It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We're studying Acts chapter 5, verse 42, and it's the theme that we're going to be kind of putting over our entire year, which is kind of like large group gathering, small group gathering, and evangelism. The verse goes something like this, day after day, they never stopped, they never ceased, they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and then from house to house, never stopping, never ceasing, always continuing to teach and proclaim that Jesus is Messiah, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the One, Jesus Christ, that's what the word Christ means. That large group gathering, small group gathering, and evangelism. Evangelism, emphasis, but really they're doing discipleship and evangelism. That's our theme for this year. And I want to talk a little bit about that large group gathering and why it's so important. Bricks, when they're used for the right purpose, are beautiful and valuable and very practical. And I think when we gather together as a people group, what we call the church, I think if we have a correct understanding of this, it's going to be beautiful, valuable, and practical. A student just showed up for Sunday school class, hasn't been here in a while, and the teacher said, oh man, I'm so glad you came to church today. And the kid goes, yeah, I was going to go fishing, but my dad told me I had to come to church. And the teacher said, oh, well, that, that dad's doing a good job teaching you. What else did he say? He said, we didn't have enough bait for both of us. 
Okay, there's, miss, there's a link missing there. There's a link missing there where the dad doesn't see that church can be beautiful and valuable and practical. And so we're going to get just a little bit, when, when we start talking about church, we're going to get a little bit into some kind of big churchy words. Whoa, watch out for that. Big churchy words. So what we use for the word church is the wrong translation. We call it church, okay? But church, that word, is a description of a meeting place where you bow down to your Lord. And so when Jesus says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, we get confused if we use this word, church, because Jesus didn't use a meeting place where you bow down and worship the Lord. He used a totally different word. He used the word that's called ecclesia. Ecclesia. Ecclesia does not mean a meeting place where you bow down and worship the Lord. It means a called out people group that's then sent on mission. And so when Jesus says, on this rock, I'm going to build my ecclesia, he's actually saying, we just have to translate it a little bit different. On this rock, I'm going to build out my called out people group and I'm going to send them on mission. We're going to gather together and then we're going to scatter to tell. We're going to gather together and be trained and then we're going to tell other people about this mission. If you start studying ecclesia, that we now translate church incorrectly, you should start in this study, this is the big word, you, you study ecclesi. Ology. All right, hang with me. Ology is the study of ecclesia, the study of the church. We're going to talk about the study of the church today. Now, if you, if I were to say we're going to do the study of the universe, you would probably understand that I probably couldn't tell you very much about the universe in a little mini sermon today, right? You can't get it all in one sitting. So we are going to talk about the study of the church, ecclesiology, but we're not getting all of it. We're just going to skim the surface. Following along? When they met together every day in the temple courts and then house to house, never stopping, teaching and proclaiming the word of God, that meeting together in the temple courts is the gathering of God's people, the ecclesia that we call church. They gave us this they gave us this uh, practice. They, they showed us what they did, the very first church, how they did it. They met together as a large group, then they met together as a small group, and they told people about Jesus. Next week, we're going to talk about the importance of small groups. Today, we're talking about the importance of that large group gathering. And I think it's beautiful. I think the gathering of God's people is beautiful. And for, for just one, one reason alone, I mean, there's a ton of reasons, but I'll tell you one reason alone. God saves sinners. God rescues sinners. That's what they taught when they gathered together as a large group. When you hear the word Jesus is Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jesus is the one, it's talking about how Jesus rescues people. There is nothing more beautiful than the, than the idea that Jesus Christ would cross the universe to come and rescue me. It's beautiful. He comes to rescue you. For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. It's beautiful. The story of Jesus is beautiful. And when we gather together as a people group, ecclesia, we hear the story of Jesus. We hear what's called the gospel, which means good news. It is beautiful. And if you just hang out there and meditate on the good news of Jesus for a little while, it brings about this, I mean, you can get warm fuzzies in there when you hear that somebody loved you enough that they're willing to die for you. And it starts this process where there's a transformation that begins to happen inside of you where you actually become a different person in your character because you are connected to that beautiful story of Christ. And it happens more, (laughs) it happens when we show up and we do it together. That large group gathering 
that they showed us, they're, they're setting a precedent for us. We take communion every Sunday when we meet, and it's mainly because we like to do it that way. Dow taught me that. We like to do it that way. We're not commanded to do it every Sunday when we meet. There's not a command. Some old school Church of Christ people, um, when I was growing up, they would die on that hill. You have to take communion every Sunday. Well, we like to take communion every Sunday. We're actually given instruction. Jesus says, when you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. But there is a precedent set from the first church that when they gather together on Sunday morning, they participate in communion. Well, a lot of times we want to follow how that first church acted when they did things correctly. And setting the precedent to take communion every Sunday, setting the precedent to gather together is important and beautiful. We also share the story, the good news of Jesus, when we gather together. And we do it in a, in a pretty beautiful way if we, if we just think about it a minute. When Nick helps design the worship service and he sets our, our, our song list, he's telling the good news of Jesus. He's telling this beautiful story. And he'll start off with the song set talking about who God is and he leads us to a response. We're always responding to what God has done. That's the way God works. He moves and then we get a response to it. And so in our worship service, we have this song set that tells us about the beauty of God and how valuable He is and how beautiful He is and how loving He is. And then it kind of reveals who we are not. We're not God. And we have to respond that way. And so we respond with confession of sin or repentance. Repentance. Or a lament. There's some sadness there. Sometimes there's even a question like, what do we need to do? And built into this story that we tell when we gather is God shows up again. And he says, I'm going to show up and help you. I'm going to show up and forgive you. I'm going to show up and send you Jesus. I'm going to show up and give you what you need, the Holy Spirit. And so what, do we, what happens when we encounter God? We respond. What happens when God shows back up? We re respond. And we usually conclude our worship together by responding by turning to Jesus Christ in communion. It's built into our story. It's even built into the song set. Listen to the songs that you sang and see if there's a God response, God response going on. The songs we just sang, He lives, He is risen, and He is alive. That's who God is. Well, how do we respond? Well, it's the goodness of God. God's running after me. That's God. How do we respond? And then Nick led us into the confession. Well, we believe in God the Father. Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the united body of the church, the people of God, the ecclesia. We believe. It's a confession. It's a response. And then what does he end with? Glorious day. He called my name and I have to respond. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. We build this into our story. You see, when we gather together as a people of God, the ecclesia, it's where we find our beauty in the story of Christ. And it's not about our beauty. It's about His beauty. But when we gather together, it is beautiful. It's also, I would say, valuable. Because... <laughs> It does reveal who God is and who we are. I'm, I'm giggling because I'm going to tell the story about somebody who's in the room. Um, we, we have, uh, that attends church here, I, I, I love this. Um, he told me I could tell the story. The coach of Wilmington College basketball, Micah, attends church here. And I bumped into him the other day at, uh, down at a restaurant. And I said, hey, how's it going? And, of course, he immediately did one of those, oh, I haven't, haven't been to church in a while. I don't want to look at him. I said, how's it going? How's it going? He goes, I haven't been to church in a while, but I'm, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And he said, I talked to my dad, and I got to meet Micah's dad, because Micah's dad sounds like a guy I would get along with. It sounds great. Harry Ogletree. Harry, if you're watching online, if you're listening later, I love this. He, Micah said he called his dad, and his dad said, did you go to church today? Micah said, no, I didn't go. And he said, his dad said, saints worship. Is that right? Did I get that right? Harry Ogletree goes to the 6th and Washington Church of Christ in Marietta, Ohio. I got to meet this guy. He sounds awesome. Saints worship. They get together. You know what? Micah showed up at church last week. 
And he's here again today. Saints worship, there's, there's such a value. It's not just beautiful, but there's value in us getting together. There's value in learning the story of Jesus Christ, but there's also value in learning how we fit in the story of God, how he wants us to participate in the church. There's value to know why God wants us. And it's not only because it's beautiful. He wants us together because he has a specific purpose for the gathering people. The Greeks had this word ekklesia. So think about Alexander the Great. And they had these these, uh, state governments, these city governments. And they would call the people out, anybody who could vote, they would call them out to meet in the city so they could make a decision about the way the city was going to operate. Even so much so if they had to go to war, they could decide as a city together, the called out ones, if they were going to go to war or not, or if they were going to go have peace or not. These are the called out ones. When the Romans came in and took over, they kept the word ecclesia, and so Caesar had his own ecclesia. And what they would do is they would conquer a barbarian nation or a barbarian city, and Caesar would call his ecclesia. He would have the called out ones, and then he would send them to go convert the barbarians to the Roman ways, the way Romans talk and the way Romans dress and the Romans laws. And so he'd have called out ones, and then they were sent on mission. And this is incredibly rebellious for Jesus to be living in Caesar's realm and say, I'm going to have my own ecclesia. On this rock, I will build my ecclesia, uh, my called out ones that I'm going to send on mission. They're going to learn the kingdom ways, and they're going to go convert all the unsaved people into the ways of Jesus, the way Jesus thinks, the way Jesus acts, the way Jesus loves, the way Jesus forgives, the way Jesus gives grace. You're going to go train people who are, there's the value in the gathering so that we can go scatter and teach. There's a value when we come together and learn what our purpose is. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, you see why that's a misnomer? That's how it was interpreted. But it is actually this word. So let's replace it. God's intent was that now through the gathering called out one sent on mission, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Church, we have a purpose. We have value when we go out into the world and we teach the world what Jesus looks like and who he is and how he loves. And it also explains it to the angels and demons that Jesus is alive, that Jesus has conquered death, that Jesus has conquered sin, that Jesus has conquered Satan, that Jesus is changing us. There's value in knowing our purpose. Another passage, Paul writes, this is um, out of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Although I hope to come to you soon, Paul writes, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how the people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the ecclesia of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Those two sentences give us value and purpose. We know where we're supposed to put the bricks to have value. He's, he says there is a conduct that we're supposed to obey when we gather together as the household of faith. And so he calls us a family, a household. Oikos is the word there. Joellen Vance uh, came yesterday, and she gave this uh, great testimony about her serving at Hope House. Hope House in town is a women's drop-in shelter. And I love her testimony. She, uh, she uh, volunteers there. She'll stay up all night long so that women in our community who don't have any other place to go can be safe. And she says, we create a safe place. And we have to repeat often, she says, that this is a safe place. Because when they come in to have that safe place, they also have to obey the rules. And she said, she loves to give these ladies who have nothing and who are on their lap, who are just, des- she loves to give them dignity. But there's rules they have to follow. So when they arrive, these ladies have to give up all of their stuff and have it locked away because one of the rules is don't do drugs while you're in Hope House. And so when they complain, I don't want to give you my stuff. I don't want you locked away. Well, this is a safe place. There are rules to follow. 
And she said she gives them dignity, and they call their, they're called ladies. They're reminded of their value, but they also have to have a little bit of a search to make sure they're not sneaking drugs in. And she says they have to check the, under their shoes and their socks and the cuffs of their sleeves, and, uh, their waistband. She said even sometimes they have to check in their hair to make sure they're not sneaking drugs in their hair. And they don't, she said they don't always appreciate the search, but there are rules that they have to follow so that the space remains what it's supposed to be, a safe place for women for a drop-in shelter. Paul says when we gather together, there is conduct that we should follow as a household of faith. There are rules, and it's not to, to hamper somebody, it's to give us boundaries so that we're not only a safe place, but we're a place where we can train to follow Jesus and learn how to evangelize, where we can be the called out ones gathered together so that we can go and convert other people to tell them about Jesus Christ and the beauty of his story. But he also uses some other terms here. It's not just household of faith with conduct and rules. He says it's the ecclesia of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Pillar is like a, 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 something that upholds the word of God. Foundation of truth is something that shows the word of God. As the church, we're supposed to uphold the word of God and also show it to other people in the way we live, the way we live out our faith. This is part of the church. Well, it makes perfect sense. If you have the ecclesia, called out ones, then sent on mission, of course, we're called out to receive the instruction, the word of God, and then we're sent on mission to reveal it to other people. It's part of the beauty, but it's also part of the value. It's beautiful, it's valuable, it's also practical. We're finding out why the church exists. One of the practicalities of the church is it actually teaches us how to be disciples. And uh, this, this kind of, I think it blows people's mind. I meet people all the time that attend church regularly, and then they'll tell me, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, maybe they don't, but just, just think about it just a second. Just think about it just a second. If you consistently show up on Sunday morning regularly, on Sunday morning just for worship, you're going to see prayer happen in this church every week. We're going to pray for missionaries, we're going to pray for our city, we're going to pray for our families, we're going to pray that God's will is done, we're going to pray that uh, the love of Christ becomes deeply rooted into our soul, we're, and we are going to practice prayer, and if you just pay a little bit of attention, you can repeat what you've seen and you've learned how to pray. My uh, son and daughter are both graduating in May. And they're going to take the ACT. And my wife, she is so good to our kids, and she wants them to be so successful. She bought them an ACT practice. The, there's a whole gamut of things to do with practice. This thing is pretty incredible. I don't know how much she paid for it. I don't want to know. It's got videos about the ACT. It's got reading material, and it's got practice tests. You know what another feature in this ACT equipping, it, another feature it has is it sends my wife an email that tells her how much practice and videos my kids have watched in the last week. Last night, sitting on the couch, ding, email. And she says, well, let's see how much Caitlin and Josh have practiced their ACT. Caitlin, six videos watched. 45 minutes of instruction, several practice questions. Oh, good job, Caitlin. Josh, zero videos watched, zero minutes of instruction, zero practice exam questions, 0, 0.00, which is going to be his score on his ACT if he doesn't practice. What good is the tool if you don't consistently use it? You might have heard that church attendance is important. Saints worship. But the attendance is not the goal. Attending church is not the goal. Learning to be a forgiving person following after Christ is the goal. And he gives us the tool on learning the beautiful story that he has forgiven us so much. Listen, I know all of my sins. I don't know hardly any of yours. 
And if we meet and we talk and we discuss and you share something about me, I might be able to determine one or two of your sins. But I know all of my sins. He's forgiven me. He died for me. He loves me. And when I hear that over and over again, it makes me respond with gratitude to forgive my wife, uh, other people, when they hurt my feelings. I see prayer happen every time I gather with the ecclesia. So I'm learning how to pray. The scripture tells us we need to speak to each other in psalms and hymns and songs so that we can encourage one another. A couple of weeks ago, somebody showed up at church with laryngitis. They couldn't sing. They love to sing. They get so much encouragement from singing. And they couldn't sing. And they sat beside somebody who was singing. She said, I know they were singing to God, but they were singing and bringing joy to my soul, encouraging me. If you show up every week, you're learning how to follow the, you know, be obedient to Scripture, to sing to one another as much as we praise God. We're learning how to sing. We're learning how to pray. If I do my job right and I read the scripture and tell you how to interpret it correctly, you're learning yourself, pay a little bit of attention, to how to read the Bible and interpret it for yourself. We learn how to give when we gather consistently. We have an offering. We have offering boxes. We used to pass plates. We have offering online. My family, we don't carry cash or or, um, checks very often. So we have our giving taken automatically out of our paycheck so we don't forget. But we learn how to give because we learn how to give to missionaries. We learn how to give to the, the functional place where we gather. You know, there's a, we have to pay for lights. Uh, eventually, we're going to have to replace these chairs. Don't look too closely, but the edges of the chairs, some of them are getting frayed. We used to have a guy that would come in and sew those up. We learn how to give when we come in consistently. We learn how to serve and use our gifts. We used to have a family that would come and sew up those chairs. They were using their gifts in the church. We learn how to pray. We learn how to sing. We learn how to give. We learn how to serve when we gather consistently. And we also learn the beauty once again and the value once again of the message, the story of Jesus Christ. See, we practice what's called the ordinances or the sacraments. We practice baptism and communion when we gather together as the ecclesia. And those two are so valuable in training us how to be disciples. Baptism, for example. Baptism is is kind of like the marriage ceremony that connects you to Christ. But it's not the water that saves you. I met, I met with um, a, a family yesterday and had a discussion about joining our church. And they said, well, here's what we hear about the Church of Christ. We hear that you're saved by the water, water regeneration. Well, that's not what we teach. If you get in the water and you have no faith, you're just getting wet. The scripture is clear that it teaches we are saved by grace. It's a gift. We cannot earn it. And it's through faith because you entrust yourself to Christ. But it is in baptism. There's a reason why Peter says this baptism now saves you. As far as I can understand, the scripture teaches that when you're baptized, that's the moment in time where God applies forgiveness. He applies salvation. He applies the Holy Spirit into your life. If you get baptized without faith, though, it it just makes you wet. So follow-up question, just a side tangent. Does that mean if somebody's not baptized, they can't go to heaven? No, I can't teach that. I can teach what Jesus says. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved, and those who do not believe will not be saved. But we see baptisms happen when we gather, and we find out the importance of them when we just Read Scripture, and we see that Paul says, when you're buried with him in this way, see, Jesus died and was buried, and then he rose from the dead. And Paul says in Romans chapter 6, when you're buried with him in this way in baptism, you'll also be raised by faith to a new life. We see the, the, the ordinances. We see this happening when we gather as a people group. We learn that we're actually set apart. We're not only called out, but we're set apart to be God's household and his family. And it's so important. We see this happen when you get buried in baptism and raised by faith. You are set apart to be part of God's kingdom and you're sent on mission. 
And every week, we participate in communion. It's another example where this, just this act, it is so strange and weird. Anybody else who doesn't know anything about our faith, they would say, this is a weird little action you're taking. It's another reason why the church, the ecclesia, the people of God, the household of faith is set apart and it happens consistently when we meet together. It reminds us that we are responding to what God has done for us. And we participate in in communion every week because we love to respond to what Jesus has done for us. We love to examine our hearts so that we can ask for forgiveness, be reminded that we have problems and we have hang-ups and we have habits that Jesus is driving out of us and creating a change in us. And nobody has got it perfect yet. So we keep responding to the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. And we anticipate he's going to keep offering us forgiveness. He's going to keep giving us grace. And he's going to keep growing us to be more like him. That happens when we participate in communion. It's so important. Where else and when else do you get it? A brick by itself is not necessarily beautiful. It's not necessarily valuable. It's not real practical. But together, when it's on purpose, when you see how it fits in perfectly to the story, it becomes beautiful, valuable, practical. That's what happens when we gather as a church. And when we consistently gather as a church, we're taught how to sing and pray and read the Bible and give, and serve. We have a call to action. What you can do. See, we're going to gather every Sunday. So one of the things that you can do, uh, (laughs) one of the things you can do is you can show up. I say this as my wife texts me, the roads are bad, I have to take your son to work, I don't want him to drive, and we may not make it to church. Thank you for showing up. I can say that because she's not here. And thank you for watching online and participating with us as a congregation. Watching online is showing up and being a part of this community. It is much more difficult to learn how to give, to learn how to serve. It's much more difficult to encourage online, but it can still happen. So thank you for showing up. That's one of the things you can do. It's a call to action. Show up. But attendance is not the goal. Learning to be like Christ is the goal. Learning to use your gifts to serve is the goal. Learning to forgive others is the goal. Attendance is the tool. The ACT prep course, that's not the goal for my kids. The goal isn't to practice. The goal is to use the tool so that when the test comes, they do better. Church attendance is not the goal. So that's okay if you miss. But the call to action is to gather together. Prepare the night before. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's my own sin. I don't know if it's Satan. But if I don't prepare some of the things that I have to do to get ready for church on the next morning, there's always something that comes up that gets in the way, that leaves me frustrated, that makes me think I'm going to be late, or maybe I don't even know to show up, and I work here. So it may be worse for you and easier for you if something goes wrong for you to say, hey, I'm out. So Lay out your clothes the night before. If your shirt needs iron, don't wait till the morning to do it because something's going to go wrong. You know, I, I think through all the things I do every morning. You know, I put the dogs out. I change their water. I change the cat water. I get ready to go. And if I have to add something else to my already busy schedule, something happens. So prepare the night before. Used to, you would say, write your tithe check out the night before so you don't forget it. If you're going to learn to give consistently, it's not about the amount. It's about learning to give consistently. It's about learning how to support and serve other people all over the world in this community. We learn to do that consistently. Prepare the night before. Show up, prepare the night before, and pray. Pray for our church service. We've been praying for our church to grow. One of our our prayer team that meets at, one of our prayer groups that meets at 8 on Sunday mornings, and most of the time, 8.30. Sometimes we even pray. We've been praying our church would grow. We had six families come and visit last week that hadn't been here before. We're meeting with them. We're talking with them. We're trying to lead them and see how we can help connect them to the called out ones, the church. We, we care more about their spiritual growth 
than attending here. And if we can be the church home that helps them grow spiritually, we want, want to do it. If we're not that church home, we want to help them find a church home that can help them grow. Uh, side note, I had a family show up one time and they said, hey, we want only hymns and we want you to send all of our offering money to a specific missionary. I said, well, we sing some hymns, but we're not only hymns. And what you're asking me to do is called money laundering. So we're probably not the church for you, but I do know of a church in town that only sings hymns. And I think that missionary is one they support. You could probably go there and you're going to fit in a little bit better to worship and grow spiritually. And you know what? They went to that church. Because attendance here is not the goal. Spiritual growth is the goal. And we want you to be able to use this family of God to do that. Show up. Prepare the night before. Pray for our church. Use your gifts. Find out what your gifts are. If you don't know where your spiritual gifts lie or how you can help out around the church, show up early on Sunday morning, about half an hour, and look for somebody running around that looks like a chicken with their head cut off and say, how can I help? I guarantee there is something you can do where you can serve the body of Christ going on on Sunday morning. That's not the only way you can serve, but learn to use your gifts to serve. Give. We support missionaries. We added a new mission last year that goes in and helps rescue women and children that are in slave, uh, sex, sex trade slavery. It cost $1,000 for the SWAT team to go in and rescue these women. They pull them out, but they don't just pull them out of the sex trade. They pull them out and they give them a job. They give them ed- education. They give them medication. And they give them the gospel of Jesus Christ so they don't have to go back into that lifestyle. Well, when we give an offering, it not only keeps the lights on and not only pays for furniture, not only pays for the salary of our staff, but it also supports missions all over our world and in our community. So when you show up, learn how to give consistently. Show up. Prepare the night before. Pray. Learn to give. Sing when you come in. Because it's going to help somebody who can't the next day. Tell someone. Call to action. They not only were trained how to be disciples, but they also kept proclaiming. Tell somebody. Tell about what your church is doing. That's a testimony. Tell about how God is changing you. That's a testimony. Invite somebody to come with you. Tell someone. And finally, ask the right questions. This is the one we're going to end on. Ask the right questions. A lot of times we ask the question, and I ask it of my friends too, what did you get out of the sermon today? And we ask the question, what did I get out of the sermon today? I am going to blow your mind. The Bible was written, the scripture that we have is written, either to the gathered ecclesia or to the leader of that ecclesia so that they could edify and teach the gathered ecclesia. Let me rephrase it. The Bible scripture we have was written to the church body, everybody, or to the leader of that local church so that they could give instruction to everybody. So asking the question, what did I get out of the sermon today? What did I get out of the church message today? What did I get out of church service today? Might be the wrong question. It might be better asked if you ask this question. What is God teaching me to do in the body of Christ from what I just heard? What did we get out of the service today so that we can go and learn how to serve? How is God instructing us so that we can be beautiful, valuable, and practical members of the body of Christ, the called out ones. Ask the right question when you leave today. What are we learning? We hope you have enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, talk to, or maybe you just want more information about our church, be sure to fill out a connect card so we can reach out and help you take your next best step. Thanks again for joining, and we will see you back here next time.